So we are starting a new series this morning, uh, and we are going to be studying the book of James. And so as we uh, jump into this, uh, into this, this letter, um, we're going to be, like I said, studying this through the next several weeks. And as we work our way through James, like I said, we do um, are going to continue to have a couple small groups that are going to be doing follow-up discussions based on the, the content of each message. And so again, if, you, if that interests you to dive deeper, um, then please do that. But this series is going to take us um, through um, the next holiday season, right, as we get through Halloween and Thanksgiving and, and move that. And then after Thanksgiving, we are starting our Christmas series. Uh, yeah, and, and with that, like I said, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine that Christmas is that close, but yet it is, right? Once we finish James, we'll be jumping into our, the Christmas season and, and focusing on the good news, right, that comes and the amazing gift of our Savior at Christmas, and during that time, again, we're going to enjoy um, several different things, especially Christmas Eve service, and our kids and youth are going to put on a program, and uh, just lots of fun stuff throughout the Christmas season. But again, today, we're jumping into uh, to this, this letter that James wrote, and so uh, again, if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to open up to the book of James. It's kind of, it's right after Hebrews. It's not a very big book, okay? It's only five chapters long. Okay, but as we look at that, though, we're going to see um, exactly that, that it's, it's a small book, but it is a very powerful book. Okay, and as we get into that, again, we're going to jump into that. But before we do that, I want to start off with just a little bit of a background and saying, who is James? Right? Why did he write this letter? Um, what was his intention? So we're going to start this morning uh, with James chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse of the letter. And this is a letter, and so he, he wrote this again to you. Uh, to the church and for them to, to be able to work through different things in their life. So as we start with James chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, This letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am writing to the twelve tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad. Greetings. Again, this is the, the dear believers part of the letter, right? It's the intro part. And you hear he, again, James introduces himself, right? Is that this is... This is who I am, and so that's kind of the first question, is who is James? Okay, now, the, the traditional author of the letter is James. He was, uh, he was a disciple, he was an apostle, and he was the brother of Jesus. Okay, now, obviously, as we see, right, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, right, and, and Joseph was his earthly father, right, God was his heavenly father, so, again, he, did, he was not a full-blood brother, right, obviously, Okay, but um, again, tradition believes that, that Mary, they had the same mother, right, Mary? Okay, now, again, that's tradition. There are some Bible scholars that kind of refute whether he was truly a brother. Some say that he was a cousin, okay, or whatever. But you know, we believe, no matter what, right, and how we interpret that, that he was a close blood relative of Jesus. Okay, and when we realize that, again, um, like I said, he was an apostle, and he also led uh, the first century church in Jerusalem. And so as we see again, as he talks about here, it's, it's, it's you know, the, um, again, the letter is addressed, right, to the 12 tribes, the Jewish believers, we're going to get there in a minute. But again, think about this for a moment, a close blood relative of Jesus Christ. Okay, and think about how hard would it be, right, for him to make the claim that he makes in this opening sentence, right? This is a letter from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know how you feel about your siblings, right? But, but to sit back and to be like, hey, I, 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 I pledge allegiance, right? He is my Lord. He's my Savior. He, I, I submit myself to his leadership and to, to the ministry and to everything that he claimed and did, right? And, and I don't know about you, but it might be a little hard for me to submit to my sibling in that way. Right? Yeah, as we look at that and realize that, I think it actually speaks to the power of what he has to say, right? Because he saw something in Jesus that was drastic. He saw something in Jesus that was real, right? And something that he could not deny. And imagine even growing up around Jesus, right? That would not have been an easy thing to do, right? And just imagine, right? It's like, oh yeah, Jesus is perfect. He can't do anything wrong. Right, as we've always said that, right, about our siblings, right, because they get disciplined differently or whatever it would be, right, and, and yet, again, I, I, can, I can only imagine what it was like growing up with Jesus as a close relative. 
But yet James, again here, makes a bold claim, right? As, as he tells us in the, in the very opening part about, about how real Jesus was and how powerful a life he lived, right? To where even such a close relative would, would call him Lord, right? And now we say, now again, who were the intended recipients? We see as he, as he directs it, he says, I'm writing to the 12 tribes. And notice again, those are in quotations, right? And we, we know, again, God's chosen people, right, is the, is the biblical reputation of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? And you see that again, they were in Israel. He was in Jerusalem, and he, again, he was even writing to, to this church, as he says, but again, he's, he, he says that the recipients of this letter, whether it's this specific church, and most of our New Testament letters were given to a very specific group of people, Right, but yet the concepts that are, that are given in them and, and the challenges that are addressed right, are, are wide-reaching to all believers. And so as we see, as he addresses, again, the, um, the, the Jewish believers that are living in Jerusalem and, and again, that are God's chosen people, um, again, this, uh, he was talking not just to them, but to all believers. But yet it's important for us to realize that this letter Right, is addressed to those who already have been saved. Okay, that is an assumption that James makes. In fact, he tells us, he says, this is to, to the 12 tribes, to the believers that are scattered abroad. And so as, as we realize that fact, the f- kind of foundation we need to remember as we study this book okay, is that James is a book about discipleship and growth in your faith journey. Okay, James is a book about discipleship and about us growing in our faith and how can we continue to grow in our faith. Okay, there, there's nothing in the letter that addresses the way of salvation. Okay, th- this letter is not about how do we join the journey of faith, how do we find Christ to be our Lord, how do we become saved through Jesus. Again, he never addresses the way of salvation. Okay, he never addresses um, Christ specifically about the cross or his resurrection. Okay, and so it's important for us to start out to say, what does he not talk about? Okay, now why is that so important for us to realize before we jump in and to study what he gives us? Because as we dive into this letter, as we look at everything he tells us to do, everything to, to live out in our life of faith, on how to grow in our faith, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, none of this is, is possible for you to live up to. Because without the power of the Holy Spirit living in your heart and in your mind and the, his transforming power being unleashed in your life, okay, if you try to live up to the things that he talks about in this letter, you are going to fail on your own power. Okay, is that you have to have the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life and transforming your mind and your heart and making its way out into your actions. Otherwise, you can never live up to these things that he tells us to do. So if you're, again, if you're here this morning and you've never received Christ as your Savior, if you've never invited him into your life, confessed your sins, and, and, and again, and, and invite him in to make him the Lord of your life, right, to make the same claim that James makes at the beginning of this letter, that he is my Lord, Jesus Christ, right, then don't waste your time trying to live out what's here. Okay, because what he doesn't tell us, right, that he doesn't address, that he's addressed so many other places in Scripture, right, is that we are saved by grace, not by works. And what he addresses in this letter are works. Because our works are important. They, that is what will help us to grow in our faith, but it will not save us. And to know that James is not a book about salvation. It is a book of growth and of discipleship. Right, it's saying, where do we go with our life and our faith after we receive Christ as our Savior? So again, he assumes that those that are reading this letter are saved. And so again, we're going to um, know that, right, and move forward of saying, now as followers of Jesus, as a committed follower of Jesus, I am I'm secure in my salvation and I know I'm a Christian. Now what do I do to move forward and grow in my faith? And that's, again, what we're gonna, the way we're going to study it as well. Now as we do that, Okay, is the, uh, the tone of this letter okay, is very blunt and very practical. Okay, it is, again, James does not pull any punches. Okay, he does not water it down. He doesn't beat around the bush, which is one of the reasons why this is one of my favorite books of the Bible. 
Okay, because he just tells you like it is. And not only is it very clear and blunt, but it is also very practical to every moment and day of our life as a believer. Okay, so as we understand this, the kind of foundation and this introduction of the letter, now we are going to jump into, again, what does he say, right? What does he have to say? So we're going to look at James chapter 1. We're going to start with verses 2 through 4. So if you have your Bible with you, you can open up with me to James chapter 1. If you don't have your own Bible, there are Bibles available for you in the seats that you're welcome to use. Again, you'll notice on the outline is the page number where you can find this passage in those Bibles. Um, but as we open up to James chapter 1, like I said, we're going to pick up now at verse 2, where it says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Well, I'm glad that he kind of eased his way in, right, to what this life will look like as a believer, as a Christian, but he didn't, right? He jumps right in. Now, again, he, now notice right here as James addresses, even in this first, well, second verse, right, first verse of the body of the letter, okay, is that he leaves no room for if, right? He does not say, if you have trouble. He doesn't say that, right? He leaves no room for it. He says, when you have trouble. So again, what's going to be the, the first step of your walk of faith and journey with Christ? More trouble. Right? Great, right? This is such an encouraging letter. Right? When you have trouble. Okay, again, he presupposes that you're going to have it. Right? There, there's no question. Right? But what he tells us, though, is in this first verse, right, in verse 2, is that, um, is that it's all about how you interpret your trouble. It's all about perspective. Now, again, we have trouble before we receive Christ as our Savior, and we're going to have trouble after we receive Christ as our Savior. Right? There are a lot of things in our life and our heart that change when you receive Christ, but the fact that you have trouble in your life is not one of them. Right? And so, again, what perspective does he tell us to take? is that now, though, my perspective changes. When I have trouble with Christ, right, I, can't, I don't need to be depressed. I don't need to be defeated. I don't need to, to you know, wonder what's going to happen. Instead, if I have trouble with Christ, now my trouble equals joy. Right, now, again, that's a pretty bold claim. Because I don't know about you, but I do not wake up in the morning and be like, Lord, please, you know, I don't, whatever trouble comes to me this way, I'm going to be so excited about it today. That is not my normal attitude. Right? In fact, usually, especially recently, right, in the last few months, about, Lord, can we please not have any more trouble today? I've had enough trouble for a while. Right? I don't want to have to call another repairman. Please, Lord. But the perspective he, he gives us, it says to take as a follower of Jesus Someone who claims Jesus as Lord is to say that when I have trouble, it is joy. Right? No matter what happens, no matter what kind of problems I have, small problems, big problems, any problems, they should bring me joy. Or at least find joy in those problems. Again, as we, as we think about that, you know, say, how is that even possible? Hey, but one of the reasons I think we feel like it's so impossible is because we confuse joy with happiness. Right? Happiness is circumstantial. Happiness is when good things happen, I'm happy. When bad things happen, I'm sad. Right? Joy is completely different. In fact, I heard it described this last week that happiness is, is what everybody else sees. It's the outside. Right? Joy is what comes from the inside. Right? Because joy is not circumstantial. Right? Joy is, hey, no matter what kind of problems I face, Right, I could find a perspective, right, that, to know that it could always be worse, right, to know that I'm not walking by myself, to know that God is still with me, that, that we're going to get through this, right, that whatever it is, right, that, that there is still sun on the horizon. In fact, as, as you think about, right, again, it's all about that perspective, and what perspective do we choose? 
Again, I, I tell you just recently, like I said, just recently in, in our life, right? I mean, Maureen, had this convers- Maureen and I had this conversation about, great, another medical bill, right? And we're like, yeah, we are so thankful that we have insurance and that we have the money to pay the bill, right? And it can all become about perspective, right? And no matter what trouble we have, James tells us, don't be circumstantial in your happiness, but yet choose joy, right? And those are two very, very different things. And then he kind of starts to explain, he's like, how can, why can you have joy? Like, what, what is the silver lining of whatever trouble you're facing? Right? And then we move into verse 3, right, where he says, because these troubles will test your faith. And he says, a tested faith equals endurance in your life. Right? A tested faith then builds endurance. And again, what does endurance mean? It means that, that you keep going, that you don't give up, that, that you're going to make it the entire way. When you think about an endurance runner, right, means that they're going to finish the marathon. Right? If you don't have endurance, you don't finish the race. Right? And he's telling you, you can find joy because every time you, you are tested, you are building endurance. Your faith will get stronger. Your faith will go further, right? Your perspective continues to be transformed, right? Again, is your faith in a place where it will keep going no matter what? No matter what someone says or does to you, no matter what our culture does or says, right? No matter what tragedy you or a loved one face, Even if someone sits in your spot in the sanctuary, will it not affect your faith? I don't know, maybe that one hit too close to home. Right, but will your faith endure? What knocks you off track in your life? Right, will we develop endurance in our faith? Will your faith withstand anything? Because that's where he's telling us to go, right? Is the more trouble you face, the more joy you can find, the the more your your faith is tested, the stronger it will get. And the stronger it gets, right, then it will always stand the test. Because I guarantee, right, trouble, and again, being a part of a church, there's no perfect church, right? Our church is going to make you upset just like every church does, right? That's never our intention, but yet that's just part of living life with people. Right? And yet, as we realize that, right, then he moves into verse 4. He says, if this is your goal, our goal is a fully developed endurance in our faith. Right? And then he tells us in verse 4 that a fully developed endurance will equal perfect and complete, needing nothing. That's a pretty strong goal. Again, look at that description, right? This description of, of, of perfect and complete, needing nothing. Now, if that describes your faith, right, if you can look at your faith and say, that is my faith, my faith is perfect and complete and needing nothing. If that describes your faith, then congratulations, you have arrived. You can relax and, and camp and do nothing else about your faith because you are there. You have arrived at perfect and complete and needing nothing. Right? You have, again, earned the right to, to stop pursuing God, right, to sit back and just go on cruise control until you arrive in heaven. Congratulations. But what if that doesn't describe your faith? What if it doesn't? Because I don't know where you are, and I, I can't make that call for you, but I can look at my own faith and be like, that does not describe my faith. I have not arrived at that place. Is my faith stronger now than it was a few years ago, absolutely. Right, but I have, am I willing to claim that? Nope. So now what? You know, thanks, James. Right? Like, just making me feel great about my faith. Right, I'm not there. Right, if you're not there, right, then one, it should inspire you to say, I need to keep growing in my faith. I'm not done growing. I need to continue to journey forward. Right, and 
if you're not there, if, if your faith is not yet perfect, complete, and needing nothing, then we need to keep reading. Because okay, he gives us the goal. Okay, and then he continues on to, to say, now how do you get there if you're not there? We're going to pick up now in this next section of chapter 1. We're going to read verses 5 through 15. Again, if your faith is already perfectly complete, needing nothing, you have my permission to just check out, go to sleep. We'll wake you up at the end. Okay, if you need to keep, keep going, we're going to keep reading. Verse 5. If you need wisdom, wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. And when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone, not do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. Believers, believers who are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them. And those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them, because they will fade away like a flower in the field. The hot sun rises and the grass withers. The little flower droops and falls, and its beauty fades away. And in the same way, the rich will fade away with all of their achievements. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterwards, they will receive a crown of life. It is that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Now again, I wish, you know, he was a little more clear, right, on things we need to work on in our life. As I said, he's very blunt, and he's, but yet he's very practical. Okay, as we read these verses, again, if our faith is not yet perfect to complete, then what do I need to keep growing? He, he gives us several things that we need to keep growing in our faith. The first one is we need wisdom from God. Okay, we need wisdom from God. We, we need to, to seek him, right, who knows what I don't know, who, who sees things that I can't see. Okay, that, that has the power to accomplish things that I can't accomplish myself. I need to seek wisdom from God. Now, again, wisdom and knowledge are, again, very, two different things. Okay, knowledge, right, is, again, knowledge, but wisdom is knowing how to use that knowledge in your life, right, to move you forward. Okay, he says, seek wisdom from God. Now, again, what's the key that James presents here when it comes to wisdom from God? The key is you have to ask. Right, the key is you ask. Again, so as if, if I need wisdom in a situation, if my perspective isn't right, uh, then James just said, hey, just ask God. Okay, he won't be upset that you ask him. In fact, he might be happy that you asked him. Because he'll give it to you. Or he'll give you a new perspective. He'll, he'll show you your next step. He'll, he'll guide you through. He'll give you wisdom. Not just knowledge, but how to apply it how to get through whatever you're facing. All right, if we need wisdom, he just tells us to ask. That's the key to wisdom from God is to just ask for it. Okay, the next thing he goes into um, is in verses six through eight, and it's the next, which shows us the next thing we need, and, and that is we need loyalty to God. Okay, we need loyalty to God. What we're going to stick with God, again, no matter what trouble I face, no matter what's going on, okay, is that I need to stay loyal to God. Now, again, notice, right, as he tells us in verse 6, he says that when we ask, right, the key is to ask for the wisdom, but when you ask, be sure that your faith is only in God. Okay, make sure that you're not relying on, again, your own wisdom. You're not relying on, on your own means. You're not relying on on the other people, you're not relying on, on any of these other things that we constantly turn to in our world. Right? He says, but make sure that your faith is in God alone. Again, so many times, right, as we, we watch our culture, if you watch even the nightly news, right, so many times I sit back and, and just wonder and pray about what's happening in our world. Right, and yet I sit and look at that and I believe, 
and I look at my life and say, I am so thankful that my faith is in a sovereign God and not in a government, not in a person, right? Not in anything else that is going on that's all been reported on the news every day, but my faith is in God and God alone. Right? And, and my, my loyalty is to him. Okay, and then as he, as he continues down through these next verses, right, he tells us, do not waver. Don't be tossed about. We don't have to freak out when the, whatever hits the headlines hits the headlines. Don't waver. Just stay focused. Keep your mind and your heart on me, on God alone. Right? And just keep going. Right? Because you'll find joy. Because this world is not short on trouble. Right? You will find joy. Just stay focused. Keep moving. Do not waver. And then we have verse 8. And we, we come up to verse 8. And again, I want to highlight, I want to take a closer look at verse 8. Okay, verse 8 says, Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. And they're unstable in everything they do. Now this verse is very important. Okay, because this verse okay, gives us the entire core concept of the book of James. Okay, this is the umbrella that, that, that goes over all of, all of the teachings, all of the, the practical, blunt, truthful things that James gives us. It all goes back to this concept. Are you loyal to God alone or is it divided? Now, again, remember, who's, the, who's this letter written to? It is written to believers, to Christians. Hey, so we, again, everybody who's reading this letter, James understands that they have some loyalty to God. They at least have one foot in God's camp. Right, but James, again, is telling us, he's saying, don't have a hand in both pots. Don't have some faith in God and some faith in the world. It can't be divided. Because if it is divided, what will happen? You will be unstable. Unstable. It'll be rocky. It'll be, it'll twist and turn. and It'll waver. Right? We'll have all kinds of questions. We're not even sure where they come from. It says he can't be on the fence. Or you can't have one foot in the world and one foot in, in God. It's not the way that for you to move forward and grow in your faith, to get to that, to that goal. He said, don't go there. The core concept of the entire book of James, again, underlying the phrase, their loyalty is divided between God and the world. Again, is it God's way or is it the world's way? There isn't anything in between. And yet, we all try to keep as much of the world as we can keep and still walk with God. Right, that's something we all try to do. And notice, what is the result if that's what we try to do? Again, I encourage you to underline the phrase, unstable in all they do. Right, is... Because the strength of your faith will literally affect every other area of your life. Every other area. It's not just that they'll be unstable in their church life. Right? They'll be unstable in their family. They'll be unstable in their... It's in everything you do. Right? James is drawing a line in the sand. And he's being very blunt and very practical. All right, and says, there is there's a choice to be made. Are you going to be loyal to God and God alone? Or are we going to try and keep our foot in both camps? And then he moves on from this concept, right, as, as he kind of plays it out in one of these areas of our life. And, and again, in that, verses 9 through 11, when he says this is the next step that he gives us, is to be reliant on God and not on our money. 
okay, to be reliant on God, not our money. Because, again, that's one of the ways we keep our feet in both camps, right? Was we, we have faith in God, yes, but I also have faith in my bank account, right? Because, as we all know, money is what opens doors in this world, right? Is, life is different with a lot of money than, than without money. Okay, money changes things in our world. Okay, and he says, now make sure that your reliance is on God, not on your money, because money changes things. Okay, now, again, what is the way of God? It's to rely on God no matter what your economic situation is. Notice he says, if you're poor, right, know that, hey, you don't have to worry about relying on your money because you don't have any. Right, like you're, you're relying on God because that's pretty much the only choice. Right, he says, but if you're rich, he says, make sure that you continue to rely on God. Again, he's not speaking against wealth. He's not saying that you can't, that if you're wealthy, you cannot be a follower of Jesus. That's not what he's saying at all. Yet he is speaking against the worldly status and comfort that wealth can bring you. Because that definitely can affect your faith in God. Okay, and then he moves on to the next verses in verses 12 through 15. Right, where again, that, what's the next thing is, the next key to, for us to keep growing, and that is to, um, to enjoy God's blessing, okay, through the avoidance of sin. But again, he's saying, you, if you want to be moving towards God, if you want to continue to grow in your faith, okay, is the, the one thing that's going to pull you away more than anything else is sin in your life. Right, because as we know, that's the core of the gospel message, right, is that God cannot be in the presence of sin. He is holy. And it's, that's why, again, he continues to transform us. That's why we need to be more like Christ tomorrow than we were today. And then he gives us some, the key to avoiding sin and to learning how to deal with tem temptations. Again, here, once again, there is no if you are tempted. It is when you are tempted. And then, again, what specific instructions or facts does he give us, help that he offers in verses 13 and 14? When you are in temptation, he says, and remember, when you're being tempted, do not say God is tempting me, because God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. Again, what, what's the key? What do we learn about sin here, right? Is one is to say, uh, you know, so many times you'd be like, why is God mad at me? Why is God testing me? Why is God... Those are not the right questions. Right? He's telling, don't, don't put those words in God's mouth. Right? Because God is holy. Right? God can have nothing to do with evil. God does not tempt you. He is not tempted, nor does he tempt you. Right? Again, where does our temp temptations come from in this? Right? He says, it does not come from God. Right? But yet, temptation comes from our own sinful nature. Right, and our sinful nature gets less and less the more we become like Christ. The more we journey forward in our faith, right, towards Jesus Christ, our destination, the less sin is a part of our life. Okay, and then we move um, out of, okay, if I need to keep growing, these are some steps that I need to do. And then, then he, he kind of has this, this wrap-up thought in verses 16 through 18. Okay, so James chapter 1, picking up at verse 16, okay, where he says, don't be misled, dear brothers and sisters. Again, I want to just pause right there on verse 16. Don't be misled. Again, this is where, this is the, the point in the conversation, right, when, I mean, it's really uncomfortable because he's really brought up a lot of things we didn't really want to talk about, right? And then he kind of looks you in the eye and he's like, just listen to me, brothers and sisters. Don't be misled. Don't be misled. Don't, don't go down the wrong road. Don't get off on a rabbit trail. Okay? Stay focused on the journey that God's put you on. Stay on the path. Right? Don't be misled because there's lots of things that can mislead you from continuing to grow in your faith. Don't be misled. Right, this is where, again, you, you get the, the heart and the emotion behind the bluntness of his words. Brothers and sisters, hear me. Don't be misled. 
right, as he's, he's, again, pouring out his own heart to us. And then he goes into the following verses, and he gives us reasons to stay focused on God. Why God can be trusted. Why God's way is better than the world's way. And he gives us these reasons. And it says, again, don't be misled by anything else. No, this is the foundation. Number one, God is your provider. And God's way of life can be trusted because God is our provider. It's not the world. It's not, it's not our ability. It's not, again, it, it's God. God is our provider. Again, in the first part of verse 17, he says, Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. Again, he's reminding us, right, that God is the creator and everything is his. And if he loves you that much, he will provide for you what you need. Right, why, how, why can I trust that I'm doing, in doing life God's way to, to not be divided? Right, first off, because God is my provider, not the world. Remember, what is our goal from verse 4? To be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Guess what? God has access to all of the resources of the entire world. God lacks nothing. Right? Next we see, we can trust God's way because he's a provider. Next we can trust God's way because God is consistent. God is consistent. He's not changing. Right? He, he doesn't ebb and flow with the world and with the headlines and with all of these things, right? It's exactly what he tells us in the last part of verse 17. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. But guess what? The world can continue to change around me, and yet God won't change. He's consistent. But as, as we realize again that, that consistency of God, right, the provision of God, and then he, he kind of he gives us the next one, right, which is kind of the, the overall arching idea, right, that God is our source of life. Why can we trust God with our life? Well, because he gave us our life. He is the author of life. But again, verse 18, he chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. He gave birth to us. He is the author of life. So he's trustworthy with my life. I can trust him because he made it. Again, it says he, he chose to give birth by giving us his true word. And again, his true word, what does that mean? Well, again, if you want to this week, I encourage you, go read the Gospel of John chapter 1. Okay, and those verses, again, tell you that the word was given to us through Christ. He is the word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Right, again, who is the author of life and the perfecter of life is Jesus Christ. Right, again, John 14, 6, for Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Again, this is the closest James ever gets to sharing the gospel message. And he chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word, Jesus Christ. He is the author of life. He is the way to be set free. And then, why would God do this? Right? And why would God, what's his motivation? Hey, and then we see that, again, he gives us that in, in the last part of 18, because God loves you more than you can imagine. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. Right? Why would God do that for me? Because he loves you. That was his motivation. Right? And because of his love, and, and he gives your provision, we can be trusted, he, he, he's the source of our life, and, and he loves you more than you can imagine, and you are his prized possession. We are his children. We are the top of his creation. And as we, we look at all these four things that, that James gives us about why can I trust God with my life, right? and he gives us all these reasons, and to say, be, and again, take this, 
this knowledge, right, about who God is and why he did it and all of his motivation, and now apply it to your life and, and stay focused. And that is what wisdom is. Take the knowledge and live it out every day. Because if your life is, not, if your faith is not already perfect and lacking nothing, then we need to keep growing. All right, how do we keep growing? Well, we trust God's way and not the world's way. We don't be divided. Right? And again, why do I trust? How, why can I trust God's way? Well, he just gave us four reasons. That right, leads me then to my final thought this morning, and that's this. All right, that James is a Christian brother that takes complicated situations and reduces them to the clear, hard truth. Are you going to follow God's way or the world's way? So then the rhetorical question is, is your faith ready to grow? Is your faith ready to grow? Yeah, I'll tell you, again, if you have not ever received Christ as your Savior, right, then you need to do that so your faith, you can join that journey, right? Receive his power and the Holy Spirit in your life, and then we start a new journey, right? And that is moving closer to Christ every day, right? Then I'm going to continue to grow in my faith. Okay, now, if your faith is already perfect and lacking nothing, it's time to wake up. But for the rest of us, Right, is will we pursue God this week? Will we keep growing? Will we do some of the things that James tells us to do? Right now, the rest of the book, again, he's going to dive deeper into all these concepts. We're going to look at some very specific areas of our life. Right, but I hope this morning, right, you will deal with whatever God's telling you to deal with today and take that next step forward. Lord God, we thank you, God, that you're with us no matter what we face. Even when we face trouble, even, Lord, even when we get discouraged, God, I pray that you'll help us to find joy because we're walking with you. Lord, to find, Lord, how well our strength and our faith get stronger and stronger with every day we walk with you. And God, as we go this week, I pray, Lord, that, that we would shine your light in this world, God, that, that, again, has so many troubles. But God, you give us light. You give us life. Lord, you give us joy. And I pray, God, that as we live that out in our faith, God, that we would show other people what it means to be a follower of you. The fact that we're growing in our faith, Lord, will show them what real faith looks like and who you are. Lord, guide us as we go this week. We love you. We praise you today. Lord, continue to help us, Lord, to, to apply the wisdom you give us in, with every step we take as we go this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.